given you an, a beautiful introduction to the, to the UN system and how it has looked at the sustainable energy applications. Now I'm, I'll, I'll pick on from where he has, uh, he has left and I'm sure later uh, Atin will deliberate more on the details of the metrics of the systems. And um, we have uh, Mr. Pranab Mehta who is an icon of the renewable energy. Everyone knows him so he should be the doing the, the winding up kind of a thing. We have, we have, uh, we had been looking at the whole energy aspect for the last uh, two decades. The Millennium Development Goals also were trying to cover in certain aspects, but when we moved on to the Sustainable Development Goals, although you find there is uh, Sustainable Development Goal number seven focusing on energy, but if you just, uh, just uh, refer only to the energy goal, then you will be uh, really missing the bus because that deals with much greater details. But uh, after the COP, the, our climate change convention, it is much more important for us to relate with the issues that has been outcome of sustainable development goal number 13. And because everything now is being looked at in, in, in the totality, and uh, you'll find that many of the decisions that were there pre-Paris conference have now they have taken altogether a different shape because when we are looking into the into the environmental aspects. The another important issue one must understand is that there is the energy water nexus which has been talked of, but it has not been given the kind of importance. And you can pick on the future energy supply sources will all depend on how much water is available. This can even affect your uh, production of the thermal uh, power generation where you need water for cooling. Will you have sufficient quantities of water or not? There are quite a few of the power, uh, thermal power plants which are right now having sufficient problems even for uh, getting the, the cooling water. Now, we'll be moving towards the power, power generation and supply systems which will either be free of use of water or they'll be using with the minimalist quantities of water. But uh, I, I'll, I'll just give you one peculiar example which every one of you uh, must have been talking about, must have been thinking about. Everyone says that the solar panels, you put them in and for 25 years, you'll get the solar supply. And uh, every company which has started, many of the Chinese companies which started only last year, would also give you a guarantee for 25 years of operation of trouble-free panel uh, systems. Now, but uh, do you realize that if you don't, if you don't clean up the panels every time, every day, the efficiency would def will go down greatly. We are recommending setting up these solar systems in deserts and in places where you don't have sufficient quantities of water, but that you have enough quantity of dust which settles over it. So what you need to do is, if you really want its best efficiency, if not 100%, whatever best you want. You need to move on from the systems which are away from water cleaning to air cleaning systems. And that's a, that's a, very, that's a very major international issue when you're going in for the method. Yeah. For the, yes. So Rob, uh, uh, what they are now calling is the robotic cleaning. Uh, that has now taken up, and that's a very major issue which people will not uh, would keep on setting up the solar uh, farms and that will not bother about how it's cleaned up. The second aspect on the solar farms is they have, uh, worldwide they have found and Italy large number of the farms have been closed down. They find that uh, after these are set up the cost of security of these farms is so high it was never thought of initially. No one thought that the security of the farms is to be done spread over large systems. The, co the, the labor cost being so high the security charge has been so high. Many of the solar farms in Italy have closed down because the cost overruns of the solar systems were, were extremely, extremely, extremely high. Now, those, that, those are the kind of things which have really affected. Now, if you look at, uh, we, we have seen uh, the, the commodity prices is another aspect and the, how, the, how the markets are moving. When the commodity prices uh, and the oil prices were linked, you had one kind of perspective. For last two years when these, are two, these two are dealing and you find that the oil prices are considerably coming down. Many of the sources which were two years back were being looked at by the World Energy Council and all 
as uh, top of the world, we can attain everything. Shale gas was being looked at as if it's, it has changed the whole scenario. And now they found, suddenly last year, they find that there's no money to go in for the exploration for the shale gas, even in the areas like Alaska or USA and all that. And the work has, has, virtu has virtually stopped. The geopolitics of it is that uh, uh, since the, the Saudi Arabians, they found if, if uh, should the shale gas come on, on in a large uh, scale, they lose the control on oil. So they decided they'll continue digging out oil as much of it is required as, as uh, at low a rate as possible so that they would not let the price of oil go up in the international market. And they have managed it. So they have managed to also kill the shale gas on one side and they have managed to control it. But now they realize that another aspect that they are realizing in the Middle East, I did a report some 15 years back, the, under the UN, the FAO was very keen that we do a report on how biomass and solar could do it. So I did it for the, all of the MENA countries. That time we suggested that, look here, you start looking at it so that you will save your oil. Use oil for other purposes, but then you use, you convert the energy that you have. Now large solar energy programs have started working in the Middle East. But uh, the, now there's another aspect, how, how do we make solar energy or the renewable energy attractive? The whole trick lies in the pricing of the system. And the pricing is really the price of the money at that, the, the price at which you get the money to set up a system. Now we have, uh, we had uh, large examples here that uh, is coming down to five rupees, 458 and all. Suddenly you found that in UAE, they have got a system which has been set up at a price of three rupees per unit. But then they, they tried to find out how it happened. They found that the Mazda was given money, all the money by the UAE government at zero percent. So, I mean, if they are not, if they are not paying, if they are getting money so cheap, they are able to guarantee for the 25 years, and they say that this will work for 25 years, we'll sign a PPA, like for thermal power plant and all. But uh, we let me just caution, I have been working on the renewables for the last so many years, and uh, not here in India, but worldwide too. And uh, there, is, there is no such system like, uh, like zero deterioration in the system. Uh, we had, uh, I'll give you two examples here, only there are two systems which have been monitored. DMRC started work about one and a half years back, they started monitoring from day one. In first, in two years they found it as the systems have deteriorated performance by 10% on a uniform 5% every year. The solar cells have gone down, the efficiency has gone down. On the other hand, on the Jawaharlal Nehru mission, NTPC had set up those systems, they have, when they surveyed four years later, they found that the efficiencies have gone down by about 12 to 14 percent already in about four years. So on an average, you can expect the efficiencies of these solar cells going down by about four to five percent. We need to we need to create large, large manufacturing. We have very very small manufacturing base. We need to create a very large solar power generation so module production facilities in the country. We don't need to have the space quality solar cells, but the solar power generation quality solar cells of the high quality, and for that we need a very, very high quality standard labs. We have a National Institute for Solar Energy. We're expecting the DG to come here. It's not here, but that is not rated, that is still not rated anywhere in the world as one of the topmost of the labs. Now, if we don't have even one single lab in, in, in our country, and we are talking of 175 gigawatts to be attained by, 22, by 22, 2022, I'm how can, how can we be just saying, I mean, as many people say, the Prime Minister is talking about Make in India program, wonderful, Make in India everything, including renewable. It, but they say that first of all, you let your people, the Indians, really have faith in Made in India products. Because only when we'll have that faith in Made in India products, will that Make in India program grow faster. And for making belief, people believe in that Made in India products are better than any other. We need the standardization, we need this check, the quality check, and ensuring that the products are being made available uh, in, the, in, the, in the right perspective. Uh, we have, uh, on behalf of the Indian National Academy of Engineering, who is the highest body for this, we, we, have, we are just looking at it, maybe it'll take us another month when we come out with this report. We are really looking at it, that the government wants 175 gigawatts by 2022. And if that is a target being set, then what needs to be done from now to that time that we do attain? Right now, just saying the Prime Minister has announced we'll attain it, we'll not attain it. 
So there are, there are large number of issues that we have come up, which also includes the transfer of power, uh, I mean transmission of power, but not only just the transmission, but the cost of transmission, uh, balancing of the system. But the cost of balancing of the system, how will it be? How will the metering be done? How the systems will go on? And a whole larger skills building development program, reaching out to, to maintenance of the systems and uh, standardization, all those things have been, are being covered. And I think in another one month's time, we'll be out with it. I mean, the government needs to talk, take those actions. We say that, yes, we want, we have set a target. We also have set a target of 300 megawatts by uh, uh, 2300. Fine, we must attain it, and we should be able to, we should be able to attain. But then various steps need to be done. I'll, I'll give you four years, about five years back, when, uh, when UK made up the model that we are now using for our uh, Niti IO. When they made that model and they came out by 20, 2050, we'll have about 60 or 70 per, 80 percent from the renewable energy. We'll set up the system, and it was presented to the parliament. The parliament threw out that proposal. They they really rejected. They said this whole model is totally false. You just can't attain 80 percent of renewables by 2050, and the British government is not going to give any of the public money for it. Anyhow, we adopted that formula. We have made many changes. They say they have made many changes, they are looking at it, but they are using the same calculator to find out an energy policy. But energy policy cannot be worked only on a calculator. Energy policy is a much more a macro issue. So that we will have to really look into it. But then I am sure that, I uh, will just stop here, but I am sure that I am very happy that uh, Dr. Gerg decided to have a panel discussion on it, where we can discuss on these issues. and. Um, after we two have done, I've, our team can speak on uh, how getting into the metrics of the, each of these components. That is, we will understand how, how intricate the whole issue is. But then if we look at it in that uh, smaller component, then add them up into the macro, we will really attain it. But if we don't look at the micro issues, then we will not attain it. So thank you very much, sir.